people into struggle? How do we bring our people into struggle? And uh, how do we bring people into the movement for nonviolence through conversations about safety? Hey, Claude, I was just talking about you. Mm. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, we just brought, we just spoke up, Claude. Um, and you're here. And you're here. <laughs> <laughs> on a part time exactly. <laughs> right and so and so yeah today we're going to talk about education political education we have reverend cecil who's going to talk a little bit about religious education um but i want to think about how we bring our people in and what are the methods that bring people in and this kind of intersects with the work of walter wink an incredible new testament scholar and a professor uh, for many years at union theological seminary because he was an educator and he thought a lot about education for the purpose of transformation. Uh, and so I want to hear some, some stories and some experiences about the transformation that you all have seen. So we have two of three people in this panel that have worked with young people of color uh, in the Bronx and, uh, and in New York City. And so I want to hear about how you have seen uh, their lives kind of change uh, by way of political education. Um, and so before I get started, I'm going to introduce uh, our, our panelists today. We have uh, Dr. Alba uh, Lamar, and I am going to read, what do you pronounce? Um, a and A, and I use all other ones as well. Right, 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 great, great, great. So uh, we're going to read their biography for you tonight. All right. Okay, Dr. Alba Lamar. Dr. Alba Lamar is an indigenous and African descended gender fluid person born on Lenape and Canarsie lands. Did I say that correctly? Alba is an artist, a radical educator, a pedagogical researcher, and a new tattooer who loves to wander with the natural world to making art, music, and engaging in creative insubordination. Since 2005, La Primera Luz del Día has taught all age groups, including infants, pre-service teachers, and elders in public, private, and community settings, and has taught in nearly a dozen cities in Florida, New York City, Michigan, California, and Shanghai, China. They received their PhD at Michigan State University, their master's in education at CUNY Hunter College, and their BA at the University of Central Florida. Presently, Dr. Lamar teaches middle school Afro-Indigenous censored their story, history, and organizes with the New York City Collective of Radical Educators, the Movement of Rank and File Educators, more, Black Lives Matter at School, I don't know how to say this word, Bushwick, Ayuda, Mutwa, Mutwa. and yeah. most recently, Dr. Alba helped co-found the Tampa Bay Colorful Revolutionary Collective. Let's give it up for Alba. Dr. Lamar. We also have with us tonight the amazing Crystal Reyes, uh, who I have gotten to know as a powerful youth organizer. And I wanna hear all about her methods uh, and what does it mean to work with young people in the Bronx? Yeah, I, I mean, her story, I, I just think I'm, I'm blown away by her work. Do you pronounce her she and they, correct? Right? She, she, her, correct. Right. She, her. Chris Reyes is the co-organizing director at the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, having most recently served as Sisters and Brothers United Director for five years. Prior to that, she was the SBU's College Access and After School Program Coordinator, SBU's youth organizer and a youth leader for many years before coming on as a staff person. Crystal played an important role in developing SBU's academic success center model and helping to bring the academic and organizing sides of SBU together, acknowledging the importance of developing individual students while also creating larger systemic change. 
Crystal, a first generation Latina living in the Bronx is experienced in restorative justice practice practices, trained with an LGBTQIA anti-oppression framework and has extensive knowledge around navigating the education system as well as existing alternative educational resources and non-traditional career opportunities. Crystal brings a tremendous amount of expertise supporting a diverse youth population, working primarily with female identified and gender non-conforming youth, as well as immigrant and ESL students using various media, including art, spoken word, technology, and fashion to support youth expression and career exploration. Crystal is also an experienced trainer and brings her commitment to leadership development to SBU to help expand our reach and continue SBU's history of developing a powerful youth leadership pipeline. In her new role, she works to develop Northwest Bronx's intergenerational organizing efforts. Let's give it up for Crystal. Well, yeah. And lastly, but not least, we have Reverend Cecil, who is joining us online from Portland. And so Reverend Cecil is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ and a brother in the Order of Corpus Christi, an evangelical Catholic religious order. Cecil serves as Minister of Faith Formation at Ainsworth United Church of Christ in Portland, Oregon. He holds a BA in Philosophy from Haverford College and a Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in the City of New York. Cecil has been active in social justice issues since his youth. Among the organizations that he has worked with are Ministers for Racial, Social, and Economic Justice and United Black Christians and United Church of Christ, McKenzie River Gathering Foundation, the Urban League of Portland, Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, Fellowship of Reconciliation, Love Makes a Family, Brother to Brother, the American Friends Service, KBOO Radio, and P Flag Portland Black Chapter. That's exciting to hear. In 2002, Cecil received the Russell Payton Human Rights Award from the Metropolitan Human Rights Center. In 2012, Cecil was recognized as one of the Queer Heroes Northwest by the Q Center and the Gay and Lesbian Archives of the Pacific Northwest. In 2022, Multnomah County of Commissioners awarded Prescott the Gladys County of Commissioners Lifetime Achievement Award for his outstanding volunteer service dedicated to improving the community. Let's give it up for Reverend Cecil. All right. And so I want to ground us today for those who are just coming in. I want to ground us coming in. Transformation and liberation is as much inward as it is outward. And that is what helped me to title this series. We don't talk about struggle and we don't talk about trauma much. And I have a pastoral urge, I think, uh, to think about the healing that is available to us. To think about struggle and to think about what uh, Jen Bailey calls politicized healing. And so as you, the facilitate, the, 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 the speakers on this panel began to go into and think about your work, I'm going to encourage you to go deep. Because the things that we talk about are the things that we can heal from. And so let's begin from this place. Let's begin from this place. So I'm going to ask you to start. Who are your people? Who are your people? We've talked about who you are. We've talked about your accolades. Who are your people? And what is their role in getting you to where you are now in education and the role of in, in the work of liberation and transformation? So whoever wants to start first. 
And keeping in mind, we have Reverend Cecil on the screen. Who are your people? You want to play? Um, just get out of the way. Um, I love energy. Um, my people are my Afro Manaras. I think I, I have to begin there. Um, they are the reason I exist. I am because they are. Um, we have a whole WhatsApp with like 200 of us. You know, we still keep in touch with my elders. I still talk to my ancestors almost daily about everything all the time. Um, at all moments, uh, they're like on my mind. Um, so they're checking in on me and then checking me, checking me out, making sure I'm, you know, doing right um, by everyone around me, by all living things around me. And so I have to give recognition to them. Um, and so those are my people. Those are where I draw my wisdom. I draw wisdom from our shared power systems, you know, that that's where I get like a lot of my political views is mm. uh, we're the original communists. <laughs> we invented communism. And so a lot of my political um, knowledge just came from my family, right? But it didn't come from government. It didn't come from um, electoral politics, right? It came from how do we treat each other day to day, right? Mm. How do we do right by others? Um, and that is hard. I was just on the phone with my best friend, Shawan. Um, shout out, she gets the jump on, she said she might. <laughs> um, right now, we just had a really good conversation about um, learning how to check our ego, learning how to recognize when it's the ego, right? All feelings are valid, however, right? All feelings are valid, however, um, that doesn't mean that that's the truth, hmm. right? So we can have these feelings that hurt or, you know, any kind of feelings. And sometimes that can be the ego outline that or it could be the social relationships that have um, been tainted uh, by a culture that is uh, a domineering culture or a culture of white supremacy or other cultures. And so my people are those who recognize that we must struggle in order to undo racism, right? In order to undo the white supremacy culture, in order to uplift each other, right? Those are my people, mm -hmm. right? I really try to pay attention to who is centering Afro-Indigenous knowledges, who wants to, right? Who wants to do right by us. Um, who does things day to day? Who doesn't just think it's like every time there's an election, right? But people day by day thinking about how do we nourish our community? How do we feed us? How do we clothe us? How do we share resources at all times? Um, and so that's, so it's very broad. It's very broad. My people are very broad, but anyone who is fighting for that, who is fighting for um, Black lives to matter for in, in the future, we shouldn't have to say that. Um, those are my people, people that understand indigenous sovereignty are my people. Um, people committed to figuring out how to do justice. Mm. So all of those are my people, so there's a lot. And my students are my people. <laughs> my students are my people. I'll tell you stories about them in a little bit. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I don't know where to look, so. I know, I was. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, I think uh, I'll go broad. I think generally speaking, like, uh, my people are definitely people in the Bronx. Uh, I say that with a lot of pride because um, even though I was born in Harlem, I I have come to like really own mm -hmm. a lot of the Bronx. And like, it comes from like the other set of people that I think is like our organization and specifically like SBU, um, the folks who uh, were in SBU uh, politicizing me, um, but at the same time, like the folks that I was, supporting um, in their growth. Um, and I know we'll like get into that, that's this is the whole conversation, um, but we, we have um, generations of folks who have been organizing who we may hate each other at many moments um, and like love each other for the same, like these are people that like want us, uh, want to develop each other, uh, grow, struggle, and like understand like the need for like this, this kind of work. Um, and, you know, I think like you want to get deep, like I think the more the, the, the people, the like my people always will be like my family. Um, not only like everything that they've done for like me, but I think everything that I've been able to understand about my family their development their growth the way that they like raised me um understanding like their struggle um and understanding like their struggle to with this like these kind of conversations and deepening their own um political analysis um helps me understand 
the world, honestly, like, uh, especially like my mom, her growth, her, mm. her challenges, um, everything from like, when we were younger, like being able to like, really understand like all of that, um, you know, and, and like how my, my entire family has been affected by so many different systems. Um, like though, like looking at them is when I like always remember, like these are the people that I'm fighting for. Mm because they represent like all the other people and like everything that like has already been in place that has shaped them um and that make this work really challenging mm -hmm. um but like i know that they're not terrible people mm -hmm. um and i know that like there's there's a lot of need for um uh, investment and time and uh like our folks and like they remind me of that all the time mm -hmm. so they're they're my people and i have like layers of people from there mm -hmm. Thank, thank you so much. Um, whenever this question comes up, I always like to begin by saying that I'm the son of Cecil and Eleanor. Um, I'm a descendant of en enslaved Africans. Um, from Virginia, North Carolina, who moved to New York City. And I am the grandchild of immigrants from Barbados who came to Ellis Allen in the early part of the 20th century. And it goes further back as the other panelists remind, reminded me, we are part of a whole and we walk um, with the ancestors. The older I get, I think the more I realize how much I depend upon the ancestors and how much their wisdom are a part of our very being. Mm. And so it's important for me and maybe for many of us to take time to listen, to have conversation with, um, to be re-energized by what they have to share with us. I think for me, at least building on my, my immediate um, family, um, but also on the communities that we are a part of. <coughs> I think for me, uh, the community is also um, the community we choose. And so I choose to be with those who continue to struggle. Um, and those are the people that I choose to listen to, to follow and to seek guidance. I think it's important just to, to hear, to listen, to follow, and to walk for me in the paths of struggle and resistance. So that's a little bit about who I am. Thank you, Reverend Cito. Let's give it up for Reverend Cito. Okay. All right. It seems like we're already coming in really, really deep. I didn't know I said committee, but I feel like we're here already. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your organizing. Uh, and who who have you organized? Like most recently, who are you organizing with now? Um, yeah, who are those people? Uh, and what are like what are they like? Anybody wants to go first? I can start. Um, so I've been organizing for like 15 years now. 
a little old. But, yeah. um, and in the those 15 years, the majority of the people I've been organizing with have been young people, as young as 11 years old, maybe, um, and have been different generations of folks and some uh, alongside with like former members, folks who I didn't like see as leaders, but that I saw and met as organizers mm. at later points in their lives. Um, been organizing in the Bronx, so mostly just folks from the Bronx um, and in coalition spaces for sure with other youth organizers and young people. Um, but most recently, like I have been organizing with more adult uh, folks across the Bronx um, and uh, sort of newish, but not really been organizing organizers, mm. um, which is a whole other layer of um, mm. complexity, I think. Mm. Um, but, and, you know, folks of different backgrounds for sure. Um, and in the time that I've been organizing for sure, um, a lot of uh, gender non-conforming trans young people uh, who are in the time that they've been in the organization have not been out mm -hmm. to their families. Um, and so, uh, yeah, though there's folks who, who we've worked with who still live very much in fear. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think those are the primary groups of people that I've worked with. My group. Um, the most recent group is uh, the group where we, we were sitting there just talking one day. Um, uh, the Tampa Bay group is my most recent group uh, that I've been working with, um, even though now I've left Florida. Um, uh, we, we still organize. We still meet up and read Asata Shakur. We read up, you know, and, and, and read together. We learn together. We still do the political education. Um, we have mutual aid pop-ups where we share food, clothing, shelter, medicine, Narcan, birth control, everything to our community. Um, we tr try to give money when we got money. We don't got money. We don't got money. Um, so I think that's and that's a group of mostly young people, a lot of very, um, I would say, late teens, early 20s. And then there's also a group of us kind of like in our late 30s and, and 40s. Um, and so the group is kind of small, but it, it's growing. Every time we have a mutual aid event, it's like a new group comes in or more people get through and we reach out to young folks as well. And so that would be like the most recent group I've been working with, which connects to kind of some of the stuff I do in New York, like Bushwick, Ayuda Mutua, which is a mutual aid group. Um, in Bushwick, where I was born, I was born in Bedside, border of Bedside and Bushwick. Mm -hmm. So I'm a Brooklyn girl, but I live in the Bronx. Um, and I love, uh, I love my Brooklyn people, you know. Um, I feel like since I was a little kid, so I want to go then switch time, right, from the present to the past, I really learned about organizing for my family, you know, um, my dad, for example, all my elders, right, we've been fighting for a long time, um, I grew up with all those stories, I grew up with all the stories of how my family organized, and how we were part of um, taking care of each other, how we took, you know, we had a high family members, or high people that were in danger, or some folks that were jailed, we figured out how to bail them out, or you know, same struggle of food, clothing, shelter for our community. How do we take care of ourselves? And then my father, when he came to New York in I think late 60s, early 70s, he started a group call or he started a teach. He's an educator as well. He started having a um, a night school. Um, it's called Escuela de Obreros, a school for workers in which it was political education and it was also kind of like college prep. Mm. And so he had that here in, I think it was in various locations just wherever they could find a place. You know, is that something my dad did when he was younger? Um, he would go to some protests and he'd bring me when I was a little baby, you know, so we're just kind of in a, that type of family. Um, so I did learn a lot from my ancestors and from my elders. Um, so it's really hard. And then um, I organized all through most of high school and undergrad and um, grad school. And then my other groups here in New York, almost all of them are education. So my education is my biggest uh, organizing like chunk, a lot of youth, the New York Collective of Radical Educators. I started working with in ooh, 2008, 2009, something like that. And we've done all sorts of really cool stuff, you know, um, getting parents opting out of testing, getting schools um, that were supposed to be shut down, kept open, or the co-locating from the charter schools, pushing schools out was something we used to do. 
Um, we jumped in Occupy Wall Street and started Occupy Department of Education, mm -hmm. which was really important. And we started, you know, sharing resources, making plan books for teachers and different educators. Um, so then that's how I got connected to like more. That's how I got connected to um, just some of these other like educator groups that I'm now a part of. Um, and so I've been very fortunate. I've been very fortunate that for basically my whole life I have learned from my elders um, how to do organizing and uh, young people are kind of like my favorite, right? They're mm. very creative. They come up with ideas I can't even come up with, mm. um, you know? So I think that that's really dope. And um, that's my favorite kind of like group to work with. I love working with youth. Um, sometimes adults just are too rigid and, and, it's, and they're in their way that they can't see through things, but young people are very creative and will come up with solutions that we haven't even thought of yet. So that's always my favorite thing to learn from them. Mm. Thank you. So we got we got eleven year olds, we got late teens, early twenties. We've been organizing with. What about you, Reverend Cecil? Oh, you know, I want to speak up for old folks, how they can be, how they they can be open to to change. Um, I'm I'm trying to really like um, be, become comfortable with this new role that I find myself in as like an elder. And oftentimes people like look at me as if I'm supposed to know something or offer some wisdom. And, you know, I still think of myself as, you know, this 17 year old kid trying to figure things out. Um, but the community I I work with um, by natural is, is maybe like the religious communities. Uh, specifically uh, religious communities who are um, on, I don't want to say on the edge or on of, of, of very progressive religious communities. So it's also um, related to um, community organizing generally. So, you know, for all my siblings who um, want to, um, try to get, figure things out without the religious community, I would say that um, uh, check out the, the religious and faith communities, um, because if you want basic one-on-one -on -one community organizing, that's a good place to start. So a, a lot of the work I do is with progressive um, religious communities and also working um, with people who are um, advocating for uh, change in, in, in their working conditions. So working with um, workers who are organizing and also um, working with um, um, uh, queer um, um, young people of color, um, gender non-conforming um, and trans folks. Um, uh, to try to create a, a safe space. And one thing that has happened over the last, what, two, three years is, you know, the organizing around Black Lives. And I've been very excited to, to work with a, a cohort of radical um, BIPOC clergy folks who, who try to um, serve as, 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 as more than allies, but as people who walk with those who are um, on the streets, um, not to, you know, give any like particular words of wisdom, but just to be with them um, and and to uh, to support to support them. I think one thing that just generally that I think that those of us who are working and, and building communities is that we realized, I think I've realized more in the last few years of the need to take care of one another, mm. um, the need to support one another, to make sure that we have um, a good support system um, and, and not be ashamed to talk about mental health and the need for um, seeking counseling. I know for a lot of people in my communities, you know, that's a big step to take, but I think it's so important and um, for us to um, 
um, to acknowledge that and the need to take care of ourselves and find ways to uh, strengthen us so that we can continue on and not burn out as so many of our um, others who have, have fallen um, on the side. Um, so I better stop because, you know, I'm a preacher and I just keep going. So <laughs> cut me off. <laughs> Thank you all for saying that. Thank you all for, for just, yeah, for, for naming who you, you've been organizing with. What is the role of education? Uh, what is the role of education? Um, I think for me, um, in a conversation earlier this year with uh, Julie from the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, we were uh, talking about what's next in terms of uh, campaigns and what's next um, while we are under a democratic administration. What's next now that, um, you know, war is still happening, right? What, what, what is next? Um, and so what she said to me, was it's political education. So it's it's actually like bring it's it's about bringing our people in or it's about also like arming our people with the knowledge that they need in order to organize the most powerful. And so I wanna know from you all, uh, what exactly is the role of political or uh, in your case, Reverend Cecil, religious Bible Christian education uh, and building a movement for peace. Uh, and I'm actually starting to think about peace in the through the lens of abolition. Uh, and what what is your experience in, in education work? <laughs> Whoever wants to go first, what is the role of political or Christian education, and what has been your experience in education? I'm happy to go first. <laughs> um, so I think the the primary role for me is about learning to unlearn hmm. um, and like you know I shared like when the things that I learned from my family are like there are things very deeply embedded in people's like day-to-day -day, like functions like as personalities as action whatever it is like these are the things that people believe in right um, and I know the question about theology is not for me but right like when we talk about like who socializes people in general like religious institutions do that uh educational institutions do that our families do that right and every single person or every single kind of uh place where you're being uh socialized is the the place that they have a responsibility to educate um but right now is to like unlearn mm. a lot of the things that we have very deeply inside of us right like and um I didn't say this somebody else did told me this but like our job is to reshape common sense mm. right like what people think is common sense mm. about like how you talk to people how you interact with people what are the needs and uh rights that you have like that all feels like common sense right to people um, and you learn that you learn that through so many, many, so many like ways or through many institutions and people in your lives. And we actually have to reshape that hmm. because it's fucked. Right. And so right. common sense ain't too common. Exactly. Ain't and so and, and it's just not uh, it doesn't follow um, what we talk about justice. Right. Mm. What it looks like for people to to have to live in a just world. Mm. Um, and so. For for me, that's that's the role that that uh, political education and other institutions just have to play. Um, and the, uh, like, what have been some my my experiences? I've done many different types of uh, um, trainings and development work with people. It goes from one on one kind of learning and supporting, mentoring those kind of things all the way to like large scale workshop trainings or one shots kind of thing. Um, everything from like a political training series to like a campaign development, uh, like uh, institution or anything like that. Um, and I mean, I've, I've had some pretty interesting um, spaces that I've like been at and they're very challenging. I'm going to say, and I think like the one thing that we never think about is how challenging it is on the trainer. Mm -hmm. um, it is actually very challenging to 
put yourself in a very, it's a very vulnerable position to be a trainer, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if it's done really, really well, mm -hmm. because um, depending on your audience, depends on what you're going to get hit with in those mm -hmm. spaces, right? And you could be a trainer and be triggered right away. Mm -hmm. And like, if, if we have a goal, like we may not meet that goal if the trainer was not prepped to mm. like get past kind of triggers, right? Mm. So I think I've seen some of that in my experience with folks is like that they've been training alongside me and have been, have like completely shut down mm. because of like what we're talking about has actually like triggered them and they mm. were not prepared to like continue on mm. um, and have disconnected or have been combative with like participants, right? Mm. And so um, there's 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 those kind of experiences. And then there's stuff where you're just like, I, I, that, yeah, like I can't believe you just said that. That shit makes a lot of sense. And like, just blew my mind, like, mm. you know? Um, so, you know, I, I could share specific stuff, but I don't want to take too much time. But I think that like um, trainings or development work with folks around, uh, like political analysis um, takes a lot of time. Mm. And if if we don't prep enough mm -hmm. is where some of those challenges kind of come up. Right. And, uh, you've been, and so, and that's what, I mean, I, it feels, and you've been doing a particular kind of training around the carceral system, which is really, really hard to teach. Like, it, I'm, mm. I'm sure that that is like really, really, I, and I'm thinking about, no first boss community clergy coalition, but I'm just thinking about how people are very um they're really resistant to thinking about what does it mean to imagine a world without cops. Yeah. So I I don't think it's resistance. And there there's that for right, sure. Right. You're definitely gonna get that a lot. Um I I think you what you know I think what happens naturally is that people have never been given the creative space to actually think beyond what is already in existence. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's actually really, really challenging because you could ask even organizers and they'll be like, I kind of don't even have the answer. We kind of do, we kind of don't. Um, we know that this system doesn't work and we know that there are some practices that have been good, right? We haven't had enough funding for them to be implemented well or like expanded and really tested out. Um, you know, like they really haven't been invested, but like it's because we don't have the thinking space to do that. And I think like you can, host sessions with people to talk about like um the carceral system and in any kind of part of it right like any part of the pipeline too and people will be like they know a system right and then then everything outside of that is like just can't think beyond it because I've never been asked this question of like what's what's the difference like what's mm -hmm. what do you change that to um so it's actually like I think, again, back to like what I'm saying, trying to reshape common sense is actually not that easy mm. and super challenging. But if you walk in there and you're expecting people to get it right away, um, you're going to get mad. Mm. You're going to get real mad. Um, and you're going to get mad at your own people, which is actually not good. Mm. So, yeah. I all that. I got something to say about that. <laughs> um, I'm going to rewind a little bit too and go back to kind of the stories I grew up with, because that was my first, my parents were my first educators, my elders, or my ancestors, my first educators. And as horrific as it is, right, my childhood lullabies, like the music I even heard in utero that my dad played my mom when she was pregnant, um, were about our relatives who have been enslaved, right? They were about Christian schools that made my parents, whenever they slumped, or if their handwriting was sloppy, or if they disrespected an elder, they would have to kneel on rice, holding Bibles over their shoulder and being whipped if they moved. And so I grew up hearing those horrific stories about what churches did to my people. Mm. And so we are not religious people. We are very spiritual and our spiritualism was banned, 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 banned. We were beat for having our spiritual practices. We weren't allowed to talk our languages. Mm. I barely speak Quechua today because we were not allowed to. Um, especially folks that look like me who are mixed with Afro descent, right? It made it even worse. Um, one of my grandfathers was jailed, you know, for, for not acting right as a black man. Um, 
So I grew up very, my parents very anti-religion, very, my elders very, very anti-religion because of those horrific stories, because of the schools they went to that are now everyone's finally learning about it. So I'm very grateful that we're finally learning about residential schools in Canada. Mm. U.S. is that starting, they're starting to dig up all the children's bodies in Canada. They're starting to do it in the U.S. Mm. They're going to get down to the rest of Abya Yala, which is what we call this continent of the Americas. And so that was really like growing up hearing that as a child um, really impacted me, especially because I went to Catholic school as a kid, mm -hmm. right? So then going to Catholic school because public schools are really violent, right? Went to public school, um, both in New York and in Florida, really violent public schools. Um, we shifted to that Catholic space and it was really challenging to learn kind of what the Catholic norms, which aligned with white supremacy culture, with aligned with um, domineering culture, with aligned with all of these gendered norms, anti, you know, women norms, the school, and then going back home to my parents to unteach that. So the unteaching. It was like a daily in our house. It was so mm -hmm. awful because it was like I'd go home crying because the kids called me poop skin and gross mm -hmm. hair and all the stuff they would say. And my parents being like, don't pay attention to them. Like, they're not even here forever. They haven't been around that long. Like, these white folks just got here and they're about to be on their way out mm. because their system is killing us. And they're understanding that their system is killing us, right? Because white supremacy kills white people too, mm. right? They're killing the environment, right? This capitalist system, right, is poisoning us, not only at the interpersonal level where we feel like it's transactional. Every relationship we have feels mm. transactional in this capitalist regime, in this colonial logic. Right. But then also, right. It's like rethinking, like you're saying, right. Rethinking all of that relationship. My parents, oh man, they fought hard. Mm -hmm. You know, they whooped my butt. I'm not even going to pretend they did it when I threw away my mom's cooking, mm -hmm. which again, they told us like, no, this food was banned. That's why your school makes fun of you for eating platanos and yuca, mm -hmm. right. And for eating fish, mm -hmm. right. My student, right. So it matched, right. What my parent, what school was teaching was to hate myself. Mm. You know, I teachers tell me, don't let's call you an English name. Like, let's change your name. Exactly mm. what happened to my parents. Exactly what's happening to all the kids who went to these residential schools, right? And so that happened to me too. So it was very, very traumatic, um, and also really beautiful. Also, I feel very lucky today, as a lot of people are trying to reconnect with their roots and trying to figure themselves out. I'm very grateful that now entering my forties, right? I'm very very grateful that I, my parents didn't lose that connection mm. right we didn't we have not disconnected we know our manaba roots we still hear because of their resistance and so that's something that's really hard to teach like you're saying for example i teach at a private school on the upper west side right now where it's a really it's a just system where they have kind of like a sliding scale um but you know where the poor kids are you know where the rich kids are you know where the poor kids are you know where the, the poor teachers are the ones that come all the way from the bronx and you know, the teachers live around the corner and they do it part time because it's not a big deal. Like you see the inequities. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a funny story real quick. And then hopefully you can hear from Cecil some stuff. Um, really, really funny. And so I'm very lucky. So the reason I'm at this private school is because I'm allowed. I have like free range on the curriculum. And so I very specifically teach Afro indigenous knowledges, you know, and then later, you know, two months in, we start talking about colonization and European knowledges. Right. And so from day one, we center you know, Africa and the Americas. Um, and so it's really funny because most recently I was teaching the students manifestations of white supremacy culture. And we were talking about kind of what it looks like in society, right? Because mm -hmm. it's beyond, everyone knows you can't say the N-word. Everyone knows the KKK is bad, right? But what are the things day to day mm -hmm. that we treat each other that's gendered, that's mm -hmm. um, sexualized, right? Or heteronormative, what is racial, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know day to day. And so the students, you know, we're talking about like paternalism, we're talking about perfectionism culture, you know, all these different manifestations. And the students at one point totally called me out, totally called me out. And they were like, wait a minute, but you stuff like that, you know, and they were talking specifically about paternalism. And they were like, kind of, yeah, but you say I told you so sometimes. I'm like, oh, dang, I do. <laughs> Thank you for calling me out, you know? And so it's a really humbling experience you got an 11 year old calling you out. <laughs> These are sixth graders right here. You know, I got a 10 year old too in the room. And I'm just like, man, they're getting it and they're getting it good because they're pointing out every time I'm inadequate, I'm saying mm -hmm. things. They call me hypocrite. And I was like, you know what? Yes, I am because I'm a colonized being myself. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're like, you're, but you're not colonized because you're this and this. And I'm like, yeah, we can be still colonized. I'm speaking English, aren't I? Mm -hmm. right? I've lost even my Spanish. I've lost the other colonizer language, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm losing a lot of my culture. Mm -hmm. And 
and I'm forced to function in this society, right? I'm forced to function here. And luckily in my school, we don't have those punitive systems like these residential schools, even though 19 states do allow corporal punishment. Um, but teaching the students about that was really powerful, teaching them about residential schools, teaching them about the atrocities of Thanksgiving that just happened, mm -hmm. right? And they they were angry at me for ruining the holiday. But now they're writing papers on it that they chose. They got mm -hmm. to choose topics and they've been writing about it because now they're like, why were we lied to? Why are we told this really nice narrative about like pilgrims coming and peacefully having a meal with indigenous people when in reality, mm -hmm. the, the holiday came from celebrating the death of the almost thousand people murdered on this holiday, mm -hmm. right? And so the students were just like, why were we lied to? And I was like, well, your kids, right? That's part of the paternalism. That's part of the, you know, the culture of, of yeah. white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And so that's the part that's really hard interpersonal. I think the one-on-one -on -one sometimes, because they got to be real. Right. So I think that's that this part is really hard. If you're teaching in a power, right, if it has to do with hierarchy and power, and you're teaching as if I'm the knower, mm -hmm. right, and they're the learners, mm -hmm. that's really difficult. But if you're thinking we're all learners and we're mm -hmm. all knowers, mm -hmm. right? The kids are expert in their own life and their own lived experiences. I'm an expert in some things, mm -hmm. right? I'm not an expert in all things. I just have lived a little bit longer than them. That's it. I'm only a little bit older than them or a lot older than them. But mm -hmm. you know, and so that's that humbling experience, I think, is just crucial, right? Mm -hmm. That that someone calling you out and I would love it to be more loving and more respectful. <laughs> I would love it if my kid didn't just call me a hypocrite. Um, but at the same time, I like it because it's real. You know, I don't like talking down to kids. I know they hate it when adults talk to them like they're you know, infantilizing is another um, manifestation of white supremacy culture. And kids, yes, they're young, but the way we infantilize them, right, doesn't give them power, mm -hmm. right? And so being able to talk to them at the real level and letting them be real without checking them, you know, we, they know we have to be respectful and they know the word hypocrite isn't mean, right? They don't say it with mean intention, right? They're just calling me out for, for teaching them things that I'm still doing. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that's really hard. That's really hard to hear from children, um, but that's why I love learning from them. That's why I love organizing with them, teaching with them, all of the above. Um, and so it's really hard. It's really hard because I'm teaching them. Some of the kids are Christian, right? So I'm telling them, but it's not Christianity, right? It's not Judaism. It's not monotheistic religions that have done the harm. But look how it has happened and look how it, where it has led us, right? So that's the part that's really hard too because kids immediately internalize, oh, but my family believes in my family. I'm like, but I'm not saying that there's, you know, Jesus said, love your neighbor, right? He was friends with everyone, right? He was friends with every. He told you to challenge the state, to not pay taxes, right? Jesus would have been my friend if he was here today. Right? We'd be hanging out all the time, right? And so that's what I'm saying. So that's the part that gets really tricky when I'm trying to say like, no, it's not a, an attack on religion. It's an attack on how people pull out what they like mm -hmm. and then attack certain folks, mm -hmm. right? And so in particular, right? Like gendered folks, women, you know, how, how does even, how do you even get racism from the Bible, right? Like mm -hmm. it's wild to me sometimes. Um, it's a matter of education. It's a matter of education. How are you just mm -hmm. pulling some random quote and acting like that's the word of the Lord, right? Like, mm -hmm. So it's really, so it's fascinating and it's scary and it's really painful. Mm. Um, but I love finding the beauty in it too. The beauty of like, yeah, learning is really painful, mm. right? We got to sit with discomfort sometimes, mm. right? This, I, I, that's why I was calling my friend Shawan. She, I learned so much from her. Mm. Um, she's a, a social worker, a therapist, um, everything. Best friend, she's amazing. Um, but this conversation about ego is really hard, right? As an educator, as someone who does have power, like, yes, mm -hmm. I'm getting paid to teach you. Mm -hmm. Like, I am in charge of your body, right? I'm in charge of policing you, which really feels really gross mm -hmm. sometimes, you know? And so I have to keep checking myself, right? Watch that police in my head, right? Tell them to go away, go away. Uh, tell them to shut up. Um, and so that's the part that's really hard, kind of re-educating yourself, rethinking what is common knowledge, right? If you turn on TV, they're teaching you what kind of colonial logic, but we can we have to learn to unthink that that isn't natural mm. in the natural state children babies they're full they stop eating they give their food away mm. sharing is innate mm. right so why have we been taught that we're inherently selfish where did that come from hierarchies exist everywhere but that's not how the whole world see it we don't see it as a hierarchy we used to work in hierarchy shared mm. power systems so no it's not common knowledge and it's not new right we forget capitalism is only a couple hundred years old it hasn't been here forever and we see how the world is dying because of it mm. right and so that's something that's really difficult to get into um but kids get it better than adults i think sometimes when i talk to the kids they get it they can break it down i want to know see so here's feels about that yeah yeah let's see so, i'm gonna shut up let's see so cool is it works with with adults right yeah. um and i want to hear about that actually um but thank you for for naming actually the harms of education because i don't think i, I don't even think 
that's something that we think about or talk about that folks who do the work of political education or religious religious education are kind of undoing kind of this pedagogical practice that has mm. been happening for hundreds of years. So thank you for actually bringing that to mind. Reverend Cecil, uh, what is the role of education? Uh, what is your experience in it? Well, at, as I want to follow up on a thing that my siblings just, just shared that I think a lot of education is, is um, reforming, reimagining, or as, as you said, unlearning what we have learned. There is so much stuff that has been um, heaped upon us. And so um, say the example of, of, of in terms of established religion. So this season, um, for Christians is a very holiday special season. And what I try to imagine or reimagine for the people I'm working with, with the children, is, is that each year our faith community, um, as most, I guess, Christian churches have like a religion Christmas pageant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone comes because they like to see their little little children acting so nice and being Joseph and Mary and, and the wise people and all. What I think is really exciting about how we um, experience the Christmas pageant in my religion's community is that we gather everyone together and say, what is important? Tell us what is important in your life right now. And so, you know, children will just toss out what's going on, you know, something's going on in school or with their family, um, issue about climate change, issue about um, gun violence. And all of this is sort of like, these are all important things. How can we reimagine or imagine for the first time what the Christmas story is all about? Well, fundamentally we discover it is about um, it begins with a, a poor indigenous young woman mm. who had the audacity to stand up and affirm her agency. Mm. And this poor young indigenous woman was able to stand up and say, who I am. Mm. And then we go forth from there. You know, the story of, of you know, the Holy Family as, as houseless people. You know, it's not just, you know, they couldn't find room in the inn. It was that it was a deliberate attempt by the power structure to keep down marginalized people. And the whole story, you know, that we uh, pretty up about these homeless people who decided to speak up and flee a, a tyrant seeking refuge in another country. Those are the stories that people in my community relate to. You know, people in my community who have had to cross the border, you know, who had to, you know, cross the river. Um, those are the stories that people relate to. And so just as the original imagination of the religious story were the stories of the people, we allow the, the, the children and the youth and the adults reimagine the Christmas story. What would it be like now if, if we try to imagine what it was to be with Jesus? And so part of religious education is allowing the imagination to, to give permission for the imagination to see another world that is possible, to recreate the world that is and say, it does not always have to be this way. As, as, as someone said just earlier, you know, capitalism is only a couple of hundred years old. Oppression has been around forever but the manifestation of it um, differs. So what we do is 
um, for education, people, it has to be meaningful to people. It has to become their story, my story. And we have to give permission, allow permission for people to say, well, I need to say this. So our Christmas pageant may not look like what you will see in, I don't know, Disneyland or something. Um, but it has real people talking about real issues and talking about what does it mean to be oppressed people and what does it mean to stand up. Um, education becomes education when people find their voice and allow those of us in authority to step down, to step aside and allow these voices to rise up. Um, I think it's important to hear those voices, to give space to those voices and allow them to, to lead. Uh, we all have a role to play, but education I think is including um, unlearning, reshaping and reshaping and moving forward um, and allowing every person um, a voice and opportunity. It's also meaning to be able to be silent and to be able to listen, um, to hear one another's stories. Um, I tend to, to not to not be the type of person who would like stand up in front of people and say, these are the rules that you have to follow. Um, but allow, allow people to say, what type of community we want to create? Uh, how do we build a safe and supporting community for all of us? Mm. And it takes a lot of patience because of, you know, if, I know I'm right. You know, I know I have the answers and people, they don't realize how dumb they are because they don't see it my way. But I need to learn how to be able to be quiet and to listen to those other voices and be able to, to allow those other voices to rise up. You know, as a cisgender man, you know, I like to tell other cisgender men, we just need to be quiet um, and give up the power. But. Thank you, Reverend Cecil. Thank you for that. Um, and that, that actually leads me to my next question, which is actually about pedagogy. It's actually about methods. And um, you, you talk about how um, standing in front of a room and kind of like saying what you have to say is not necessarily probably the most successful method in education. And I think folks who do political education work know this. Um, but I actually wanna uh, hear stories now from you about workshops or teachings or like just maybe giving one example of an experience that really worked for you and showed you the power of good pedagogy. Um, I, and I, I've had my own experiences um, where I've seen World Cafes done very well, I've seen uh, theater of the oppressed done very well. And I've seen kind of like the scales fall from people's eyes by, by being able to be in their bodies. I've seen somatics work really well in education work. And so I'm curious with you all about your experiences of, of kind of seeing and witnessing, you know, the power of transformation through education. Uh, and I think that's kind of the meat and the heart of this conversation because, I mean, and we also know that Crystal said it doesn't take one time. Sometimes it's, and most of the times it's like session after session after session, which is also something I think I'm going to have to keep doing with this week series, right? Um, <laughs> but it's, it's you know, I, I want to hear about, about what works in education. What works? Yeah. I, I'm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll tell you this one, one, one story. You know, when I don't have an answer to the question, I can tell a story. 
So um, I was in, in, in sitting in a, a classroom with um, a bunch of second and third graders. We were trying to um, engage them in, in learning how to work together, to build community with one another. And since this was a Christian setting, we said, you know, Jesus said, you know, because Jesus says something, you supposed to listen. So, you know, Jesus says to, to love one another and how you're supposed to treat one another and be respectful for one another. And, you know, and then, you know, I'm, I'm building up to my, my major point. And the golden rule is to love one another as you would have others, but do unto others that you would have them do unto you. Da da, you know, I'm waiting for the applause from the from the kids. Dead silence. Jania uh, raises her hand, and Jania is is a real leader. So I, you know, okay, I, I know Jania is about to say something. So yes, Jania, what is it? Well, the golden rule is okay, but in my school, we go by the platinum rule. And I said, what's that? And she said, well, you should treat people the way they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, a, a, a light went off in my head. I mean, especially in this era when we're so often uh, want to force people into certain boxes, especially um, for, for um, gender non-conforming, non-binary trans folks. Mm. The question isn't, I want you to be like me. The question should be, how do you want to be referred to? How do you want to be treated? So. Um, doing my great lesson on how to build community, seven-year-old Jania taught me uh, the rule that um, we should treat people the way they want to be treated. And so um, I think part of the opportunity is to give space, again, for people to speak up and for different I ideas to, um, to rise up. Um, I can have all my lesson planned and be want things to go a certain way, but I also need to give, give space for uh, for the spirit, for the spirit to to rise up, hmm. and and not to be have to be so um, engaged in my my particular point of view. I need to hear other voices. But uh, these other, these educators, they probably have great stories to tell. I know they do. Um, that brings up a lot for me. Um, but so the first thing I'll say is we do popular education, which is what a lot of folks are kind of describing already now, right? Like um, popular education is basically like, uh, the information really isn't held by the facilitator necessarily that that um, uh, other folks are contributing mm -hmm. to like the the um, workshop or training or whatever. And for us, that's like important because um, a lot of what you're saying, like when we talk about young people and power dynamics and just like how um, how like how they are already perceived in the world um, coming into a space where we're asking them to learn and unlearn is actually um, again standing up saying whatever the information is not like here or with the facilitator it's like in the room and that we're generating the the thing together and I think um with that kind of practice in mind, it actually helps um, people be vulnerable, people be included, and like to then come up with the the creative things that like you want uh, for future kind of 
sessions or for like how you want to develop people beyond just like uh, the, the training or whatever it is. Um, and so for us, right, like, I think different, any met, like anything that you ever want to educate people on, or even like you, you can go from like talking to somebody, it's always like, what is like, what does that make you feel? Or like, what comes up for you? Um, like trying to get like information from the person, like how does that relate to you? Um, do you, do you have experience in these things? Right. It's actually really important. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can do like a 15 minute presentation and like be able to like get people to bring in their own experiences because people learn like very often understand things based on their experience and their relationship to the system, to things, right? Like they can look at the world and be like, I see myself, like these are the things that I see myself in and are like how I connect to, to stuff, right? Um, it's like for me, training is not like about sharing information. Like, if I'm just there to educate people, I'm already wrong, right? Mm. Um, I'm actually there to, like, develop folks um, with the hopes that folks are also, like, thinking about how they want to then impact and reshape whatever systems we're talking about, too, right? Um, and so in, in terms of, like, models or things that work, right, very basic for me is just, like, you can't do all the talking <laughs> and you have to like get your audience to participate, right? Um, for us, like doing restorative justice and restorative justice is actually like a, our transformative justice work is very inclusive mm. of community, right? Mm. And so there is um, a need for people to kind of see their themselves in the conversation, right? Mm. It's not like a I'm going to tell you everything. It's actually like a two-way thing. And so like, we all have to contribute. Um, and so I think some, and when we're talking about like, what does safety mean? Or like, you know, when we, when we want to start engaging people in our work around like uh, police free schools or policing in general, um, asking people a very basic question of like, what does safety mean to you? Like, what does it look like? What does it mean for you to feel safe? Or, um how do you make other people safe yeah. um and that kind of question right can bring up so many a range of things mm. for people and I think like doing a community circle where people get to share both opt in and opt out of answering the question is actually really important mm. like because they have then they have agency of how they want to be in the space right mm. um so we've done stuff like that several times. Um, and again, like, you know, maybe somebody passes on the first round of the question and that's fine, right? You chose to not say anything. Um, maybe you're one of the first people who are going around and you're like, I don't really want to say an answer that like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And I, that everything that other people are saying in the space might spark something else. Mm -hmm. um, and they might want to contribute to the next round or like pass the 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 talking piece to me again or whatever you know like and people really feel like they can contribute to something because it was it wasn't even like a, I'm gonna tell you what safety is mm. it's a what do you all think mm. and people get to like go around and share and do all this mm. right and really contribute um so I think when people have that opportunity it helps people feel comfortable um and decide the level of like uh, vulnerability that they want to have in the space mm -hmm. um and again may take several tries some people may be very quiet for a very long time right and I think like you could even look at like how AA functions right mm -hmm. AA like people again opt in opt out choose to speak don't mm -hmm. share you know like and it's a, it's a kind of like a, they have their own agency because the, the kind of change and the kind of development that people want to do is really on them mm -hmm. and how much you really want to like um, dive into it, right? Um, so I think that's, that's one. And in terms of like other, we, we do like combinations of stuff. And so we don't ever stick to like one method sometimes, mm -hmm. which is good and bad, I don't know. <laughs> Um, we have a, a, a workshop, um, called, I think it's systems of oppression or out of the box. 
Um, and what we actually do is we like um, do a little kind of design box on the floor. Um, and we ask four volunteers at minimum to stand up and be like the walls of the box, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the audience, right? The rest of the people, they, they too can contribute. Um, get post-its, right? And they get, and we ask them like, write a time or uh, a, a thing that you've ever, that has ever made you feel like oppressed, right? Um, and folks write it, right? And then we ask to go up and to post it onto the walls and say it out loud if you want to. Folks go around, some people say it out loud, some people don't, they just kind of post it. Um, and like, it actually gets really, really deep because people go from saying like slurs that people have said to them throughout their lives um, to like times where they've like experienced like oppression, like whether it was like being discriminated at a, a store, like followed in the streets and those kind of things, right? Like, and, and people go around and they do that. And like, there's like a lot of silence and people are just kind of hearing it. And like, sometimes you hear the same exact thing um, over and over again, or sometimes you hear um, something like that you wouldn't think was like an oppressive thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, super intense session that then um like folks get really emotional mm -hmm. folks get really emotional because for the most part it is probably the first time people are have been asked to name something mm -hmm. that has oppressed them mm -hmm. and saying it out loud right like for those who say it out loud or even just write it like it's like not a thing that people are used to doing. And so it brings up a lot for them. Um, it brings up a lot to hear stuff from other people, right? Mm -hmm. Like even like to hear it and be like, I've done that before, or like I was probably the person who did that to them or something like that, right? And like I that like that kind of activity um brings the group together, right? I think it brings like it raises people's consciousness. Um and it it also like gets people thinking about like how do we break the system, right? And so you know tied to this kind of activity, and we've learned this over time too, right? Like we have like a a, a healing space where people can kind of leave and be at and just kind of be alone or like talk to other people um, because people do get very emotional about um, like saying and naming those things. Like people have left. Uh, the whole session kind of thing and so we've had to like adjust in those kind of sessions um, but you know it is a space where people have felt like they have felt healing right like being able to say the words out loud and then also like what is the thing that we need to change and shift about mm -hmm. like the systems of oppression um, because like the session goes on right like we talk about like the system talk about socializing people um, people then share like their own personal experience and then it's like how do we break out of this system mm -hmm. and people get to then think about like all the things I just heard all the ways that we can probably like shift like both um, interpersonally and sh shift like systems as a whole um, and like it becomes a, a really good space I've actually done this activity with young people and adults and people really get into it, right? Mm. Um, and I, you know, I don't throw, I don't throw shade at older folks. Uh, I think some of our seniors have some very, like, like they, if, and I like, I think that they hold a lot and like have like really shown up for people. Um, and that's like our seniors. I have a, uh, maybe at the mid level of, I want to say 30s to 40s and that group right there I think is challenging you talk about 50s yeah. and older mm -hmm. 50s and older like I think like they got it right like they went through some shit and they're like I like I got you mm -hmm. right and so but in the age range I feel like that kind of activity again people don't get asked the question like often like mm -hmm. they don't get asked like tell me something that like really like messed you up or whatever and then like or they don't like it's not normal 
to talk about it, right? Like we were told to be silent. We're taught to be silent about like our oppression, right? And so um, when you ask people something to be vulnerable, like it really gets people thinking and to like break away and and be vulnerable in a way that like um, allows them to then like hear and see everyone else. So it really builds like that technique of, of community. And like, we've done this a lot in retreats too, because then they have like, we do that in the beginning kind of thing. And people are like, oh my God. And they want to have one-on-ones with each other and like really want to build. Um, and that and for young people that really works to be like, yo, like I, I hear you. And like, I saw that and that's crazy. And then like folks really have like a very healing moment from that. Mm -hmm. um, and then like, it's like, we got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, and I would say like, I'll, we've done this in programs where we probably will never see the young people again. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that right now. We've done it with places where people we'll probably never see people again um, and run whole programs with people around stuff like this. And like, I've met young people from years ago and that now are like super like, conscious and have like connected through like our social media and still like you know talk about the work that we do even though they've never really got involved in the organizing work and they're like you know they they've they've donated to the organization they've talked up, up the organization to different folks um and you know in my head I was like well, I don't even know that we actually touched you that deeply because you you never talked to us after that you know um so I've met people like that and I'm like, oh, I do remember you. Like, I do know who you are. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even realize that. Like, it meant that much to you, but like it did. Yeah. And they just, it didn't happen for whatever reason that they were like members or leaders in the organization. But like, they're all in the world still like holding a lot of that um, yeah. that we did with them. Yeah. Dr. Alba, close us out. Um, what works? What have you seen? Work? I love um, what Cecil said about the plant, the platinum rule. I hadn't heard it being called that, but I learned that from my youth, right? About how to treat people how they want to be treated and not how you want to be treated. That was really hard, but I'm very glad my 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 the youth I, I I'm around that taught me that. Um, and I love I love what you've been saying about like um you don't just give information, right? You have to learn it together. You have to kind of go through that process, right? The process is really important, right? And even if it's painful, right? You start to appreciate kind of like the layers, right? The kind of like layers of the pain and understanding oppression, how it's like a very common sentiment that we don't name enough, right? That that can't be said enough, right? We don't talk about this trauma enough, this inherited trauma, this generational trauma, right? Um, I struggle with my ancestors, right? And I struggle with my elders sometimes because, you know, some of the things that we just clash, right? The way they view my role, the way I speak, the way I'm putting a target on my back or, you know, mm -hmm. might speak to, to both of them, I get hurt. Um, a lot of it is about safety. So I know a lot of their words comes from a loving place, but it comes from like a fear of safety. Of like, why would you put yourself out there saying these things that are going to put you in a hate website like I was put on one time? Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to share a story that where I think it was like a very very brief. It was way, it was like in my early twenties, I was teaching third grade and um, these two best friends, this is a story I wanted to share. They're two best friends. Uh, we got Serenity and uh, Amina. I'm teaching in Brooklyn and these two eight years old, right? They're best friends. They do everything together. They even walk to school together. Their friends are, their, their parents are friends. Everybody knows them. Everybody knows their best friends. And one day um, Serenity comes up to, or uh, Amina comes up to me and says, um, no, no, Serenity comes up to me and says, um, I'm really upset because Amina's mad at me and she doesn't want to talk to me and I don't get it, you know? And I was like, well, what happened? You know, like, I don't understand. Tell me the story, like what happened? It happened at recess. Um, they were playing kickball and the ball, one of the kids hit Amina in the head with the kickball, she fell over and Serenity giggled too. So Serenity did help her up, but Serenity laughed. So the whole class laughed when Amina fell over and Serenity was like, oh, I'm so sad. You know, she laughed, but then she did, she goes, but I did help her up. I just, I did kind of was funny, right? Like how she felt was funny to me. I couldn't help it. And she goes, but now Amina won't talk to me because she's so mad. You know, can you tell her that she's my best friend and I really want to talk to her? Mm -hmm. And I was, well, I can't tell her to talk to you, right? But let me see what she has to say. And let me see if she wants to talk to you. And so I go to this eight-year-old, I go to Amina and I love her family and, and she's, she's just such a cool kid. And I'm like, hey, you know, like, 
I know this happened like yesterday, you know, so I know that this is like fresh, but like, what's going on? You know, like, she's your best friend. She t- she told me that she said she's sorry. She told me, you know, she told me the whole situation. And I think she really is sorry, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think she's your friend. And I think she really is sorry. I think just in the moment she was caught up in, in, in the, you know, in the event. And Abrina said to me, such a wise little kid, she goes, um, she's still my best friend. You know, I just, I have nothing nice to say right now. You know, she goes, so I think I want to give it a couple of days. And I was like, what? Like, what did you just say? I was like, I, I was blown away by her maturity of saying like, now is not the time because I'm heated, right? Which is how I start to word things now. I start to think about that child when I get in these heated moments. When the moon is in Gemini, my feelings are going everywhere like they are this week, right? I have to like pause, right? I got to like pause and be like, thumbs happening. My anger is through the roof or like my emotions that when I cry, when I scream, I'm going through all of this stuff. Give me a, give me a second, right? Let myself heal through this first, right? Let me not act in rage. And so it was so beautiful. I was like blown away. I was like, where did this kid get this from? And the parents were also blown away when I shared with them. They're like, we don't say stuff like that. Like we fight. And you know, they were like, we fight if we, you know, we don't give it space. You know, she hears us screaming sometimes and we feel bad, but you know, we get in it. And she came up with that, like, on her own. Like, she knew, she'd known this kid since they were, like, little kids. This was third grade, so I think they met in preschool, right? So they know each other, like, four or five years. And she knew that she wanted to keep that friendship. And so that was the part that I thought was really beautiful, because she's like, yeah, she's still my best friend. I just, I need to give it a couple of days. Like, mm-hmm. I'm still, you know, I don't want to, I don't have anything nice to say. Mm-hmm. So the fact that she was able to, like, recognize that, like, the words that are going to come out will hurt. Wow, that's hard. Right. I'm in my late thirties now. And I still think about that for the people that I love. I really try to like pause and be like, okay, I need to figure out how to say this right. In a loving way, we have come together in like a loving engagement. Right. And there are people that you have to love far away sometimes. Right. There are some people that you can love. I'll give you food. I'll let you stay at my house, but we're not going to talk. Right. So there's people that you can love. And then there are people that you love way, way far away. Where it's like, <laughs> nope, we're not interacting. You know, you can be my Facebook friend and that's it. You know, I put them kind of, you know, Instagram a little bit closer friends, but I'm not calling you every day. We're not checking in. We're not hanging out for a while. Right. I got to give it time and space. And so that's something that's been really valuable that I learned from that little kid. And I was just blown away by this brilliance of this eight year old. Um, and then Serenity understood it, which was the best part. Right. Then I go back to the other friend and I'm like, you know what? she's not ready. You know, like she's not ready to talk right now. She wants to give it a little bit of time. And Serenity was like, how many days, you know, like I want to, <laughs> I want to go home with her. I'm excited. And, and I think, I think on the second day they did walk home. So on the first day they didn't talk. And then the second day they like walked home together, but they didn't talk much. And then by like Friday, they were like in it. They were like so excited. You know, it was like, by, I guess because of the weekend or something. Um, so I think she gave it like two, three days or something like that. And then by like the final day, they were like back to being like their normal best friends. And I was like, wow, that's like such a beautiful lesson, right? Such a beautiful lesson. And, and they came up on that all by themselves, right? They knew how much they loved each other mm-hmm. and they knew how much they have to care for each other mm-hmm. and nourish each other in that way. Mm-hmm. And so I like the way that, um, um, I like what you were saying about, for example, how we have to support each other, right? So it's not about, right, this hierarchy of like, I own the knowledge and we're just, and I'm just giving it to you. Mm-hmm. But also I see your pain, right? Recognizing that I see what you're going through and how can I support you, right? I'm not going to help you because that com- becomes a charity mindset, but how can I support you, right? And asking that, assuming what people need, but mm-hmm. literally being like, how? And what resources that I have that I could share with you if I'm not able to support you, right? So mm-hmm. how do we come together as a community and figure out where are the resources, right? How do we not call the cops and help each other in times of crises? Mm-hmm. Um, how do we pay social workers more so that, that we have more of them in schools instead mm-hmm. of cops in schools mm-hmm. instead of violent um we instead of going to the violence how do we nurture that kind of like healing together so that's like where I'm kind of starting to like learn from from a lot of young people is how how we come together to support each other through the healing how to nourish our thriving how to really focus on joy Mm -hmm. right and so I'm still learning but I think the kids really give me a lot well it seems like it seems like a method that works is is trusting and believing in in our students yeah always always yeah uh, there's some a book somewhere, uh, probably not the best reference of uh, place, but um, written, it's called uh, Pedagogy of Trust. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually really good, uh, like, framing of how, like, the education system can uh, be about trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, like, is a baseline for many, many uh, ways to, like, develop folks in creating like this collective like 
uh, mindset versus an individualistic mindset. Mm, pedagogy mm. of trust. Everybody should write that down. Mm. I've heard about it, yeah, yeah. And it's eight o'clock, so we're gonna get put out of here. But um, I want to say that you all have been amazing. Um, and I hope that educators will be able to look back at this conversation. Uh, folks that are thinking about doing a workshop on peace or anti-militarism and be able to say, I can teach. I can be a teacher. Uh, we all have the power to be profound educators. And so I want to say thank you for helping me to, uh, to do this conversation around education and transformation. Um, and I hope that everyone has a great night. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Reverend.